The discovery in 1922 of the tomb of the boy king Tutankhamun was one of the most exciting discoveries in the history of archaeology. The only tomb of a pharaoh found intact up to that time. Thousands of priceless treasures, tons of gold and the spectacular death mask are what we'll be discussing in this program. Pharaohs of the 18th dynasty did not build pyramids. They chiseled their tombs out of the side of the Valley of the Kings. And they had long tomb passages with beautiful paintings adorning the walls. At the end of the passages, they made their tomb chambers and they had a sarcophagus in which they were buried. And so this is where the mummy of each king was placed. That scheme didn't work either. The tireless tomb robbers soon found their way into the tombs and deprived them of all their valuable contents. And so the officials of the 20th dynasty gathered the mummies together. They buried 13 of them in the tomb of Amenophis II, and they took another 40 over to a shaft near the temple of Hatshepsut and put them down there. That's where they stayed for over 3,000 years. In 1881, the tomb robbers were apprehended and they agreed to bring Egyptologist Heinrich Brucht to the place where the mummies were buried. And they brought him to this lonely valley and took him right up the end there, up where those heaps of rubble are. <laughs> well, I don't know whether Brucht found it as hard as I did. A slippery shale, you know, you go one step up and two steps back. Well, these fellows brought Brucht to this shaft here. And they said, here it is. And they produced a rope. And they said to him, all right, you go down here, 10 meters. And Brooks suddenly realized he hadn't told anyone where he was going. And these fellows could just lower him down the shaft and then disappear. Nobody would ever hear of him again. Well, he looked into their faces and said, okay. They lowered him down the shaft, 10 meters. He went 30 meters along. And then his delighted gaze rested upon 40 mummies being buried there for more than 3,000 years. And they were all neatly labelled with the names of the pharaohs. They took them from here down to the Nile Valley, floated them down the River Nile, and they're in the Cairo Museum today. Also neatly labelled, only this time in English. In 1898, Victor Lore discovered the tomb of Amenophis II. And he found all these mummies that had been buried there. And so he had them transferred to the Cairo Museum. In 1902, an American, he wasn't an archeologist, he was really just an adventurer with a lot of money, did some excavations here. And he found the tombs of Haremheb and also the tomb of Thutmose III. That mighty conqueror, you know, the greatest of all the pharaohs. You have to go up some steps now to reach this tomb. It was right at the end of the valley. And then you go down the valley into the shaft. And at the end of the shaft, his sarcophagus is still there. Then in 1914, Davis announced that the valley was exhausted. No more tombs. He'd found them all. And so he relinquished his permit. And that's when Howard Carter came into the scene. Well, Carter wasn't able to start immediately because the Great War started, but when it was all over and the shooting was finished, Carter came here and he started excavating. He was supported financially by Lord Carnarvon of Wales, and he worked here for six seasons. Finally, in 1922, Carnarvon said, listen, old boy, we just can't go on forever. And then Carter made that memorable plea, please, just one more season, a plea that was to make history. Well, Carter figured that 
down there, there must be the tomb of Tutankhamun. You see, all the other tombs have been found. Just one king of the 18th dynasty had not been discovered. So he felt sure it was there somewhere, but where? He went over every nook and corner in the valley, couldn't find a thing. And at last he thought, there is just one place there could be. You see, down there is the tomb of Ramesses VI. And when that tomb was excavated for the king, they took all the rubble and dumped it on the ground. And Carter thought, maybe, just maybe, Tutankhamun's tomb is under that rubble. So he set his men to work to remove this mound of rubble. And he left the scene, and one morning he came back there. And from the deathly silence and the men standing round looking, he knew that something had been found. And when he came up to it, they pointed down to a step that had been exposed under the rubble. And Carter knew that he had something. And so he ordered the rest of the rubble to be removed, and step by step it was exposed, until he came down to a slab of stone, which was a doorway. And Carter's heart leaped as he realized that the necropolis seal was on that door. Now, you don't seal something unless there's something valuable inside. But what? Was it Tutankhamun's tomb? Or was it just some place where they'd stored a lot of valuables? Had the tomb robbers got in? He didn't know, but he kept on going. And right down at the bottom, he found the cartouche. That means the name of Tutankhamun. He still couldn't be sure. But he figured there was something there. So he fired off a telegram to Lord Carnarvon back in Wales and said, you better come. And so Carnarvon and his daughter, Lady Evelyn, came. In the meantime, what did Carter do? He filled the whole thing back in again so that you wouldn't know that there was anything there. Well, when Carnarvon came, of course, the press turned up and all the officials. And so once more, they removed all the rubble there and exposed the steps. And here was this door. And that's when Carter took a hammer and a chisel and he began to make a hole in the door. And when he did, he discovered that inside the tomb passage was filled with rubble, except for one corner where obviously the tomb robbers had got in. So the tomb robbers had been in there. How much did they get? Did they get everything or did they leave something behind? Well, all the rubble was taken out of that tomb passage and then they came to another door. And then came the exciting moment when Carter took another hammer and chisel and he hammered a hole there. And at last, he took a candle, put it inside to make sure there were no poisonous gases that were going to asphyxiate him. And then he peered inside. There was an, a, a silence and a pause that was deafening. And at last, Carnarvon couldn't bear the suspense any longer, and he said, can you see anything? And Carter, whose eyes had now become accustomed to the gloom, said, yes, many wonderful things. And that was the understatement of the century. One of the best-known items that was found in this antechamber was the beautiful throne of Tutankhamun. On the back of that throne is depicted Tutankhamun with his lovely young wife, Ankus and Harman, offering incense or perfume to him. Then there was this treasure chest, which uh, was beautifully inlaid and had a scene on the side of it of Tutankhamun in his war chariot fighting his enemies. And then there was this Anubis, the jackal god, god of the dead, a statue of him. Tutankhamun had a footstool. In fact, he had two footstools. There was this one here, and uh, then there was the other one with two Nubian heads on it, indicating, you know, that he put his feet on these Nubians, these wretched Cushites. There was a beautiful bracelet with a, uh, with a beetle, you know, the scarab beetle on it. And uh, then there was his chessboard, you know, he apparently played a sort of a game like chess. There were these two lovely alabaster statues and his hat or couch. That means the couch on which he used to lie and it was shaped like the goddess Hathor. 
uh, there were these two daggers. One was gold and one was iron. And of course, of the two, the iron one was the more valuable because iron was more difficult to obtain. Beautiful touch pendant. And uh, then a uh, scene of his wife and himself in the garden among all the beautiful flowers. And uh, then there was the statue, an ebony statue, sort of standing guard over the place. There was his canopic shrine and the four little uh, statues in which the canopic uh, contents were placed. And then there was the shrine with the four cherubim guarding it, and his alabaster cups, and then his inlaid chair, beautiful thing, and this magnificent cup, which uh, was, um, had pictures inside it. And when you put a light inside, it is just beautiful, shining through the translucent alabaster. And Totankhamun's golden gods. And uh, then this lovely uh, pendant that hung around his neck, around his breast. And uh, then there was his hippo couch, like a hippopotamus, and his beautiful alabaster drinking cup. He had a golden fan. There used to be ostrich feathers out the, out the top of it, but of course they have disintegrated. But the golden fan, beautifully uh, inscribed, has been left behind. There were two chariots there, golden plated, and his Nubian dancing girls, and another chair that he had, and uh, another breastplate of the uh, vulture god. There was a strange little um, image of made of solid gold. It was actually his, his father. Uh, that is Armenophis III, apparently when this father was just a boy. How it got into the tomb, nobody knows. And then there were his canopic urns and his headdress. You know, uh, we like a, like a nice soft pillow, but in those days they had a stone for their headrest. And here is Tutankhamun's headrest, made out of ground glass, sort of stuck together. Then there was his bracelet also with scarab beetles on it, and his golden bar bird representing a flight of his soul. And then there was another couch, a golden couch. All these things and many more, more than 2,000 items, were in his outer antechamber. And then when Carter broke down the partition wall and uh, looked into his tomb, all he could see was a solid wall of gold. He didn't know what it was at first, but then he went round to the end and opened up the doors, and there inside that was another golden box. Inside that, another golden box. Inside that, another golden box. Four of them all together. And then inside that, there was the sarcophagus of stone. He lifted the lid of that, and inside that was a beautiful golden coffin. And under the lid of that was another golden coffin. And under the lid of that, yet another golden coffin. And finally, two tank garments, beautiful death mask. All of these are just part of the treasures of two tank garments too. Well, two tank really did have a magnificent burial. And remember that his tomb was one of the simplest in the Valley of the Kings. You imagine what the others must have been like. Wouldn't you like to have a burial like that? Oh, well, Moses could have. You know the story of Moses? Pharaoh's daughter came down to the river one day and she saw a little basket floating among the reeds. You see, Pharaoh had made a decree that all the male babies were to be thrown into the river. And this family had fulfilled the letter of the law, but not exactly the spirit. They'd taken the precaution first of putting their baby into a waterproof basket before they threw him into the river. And Pharaoh's daughter came down there and saw this little basket with this little baby weeping and it touched her mother's heart. She, see, she didn't have any children of her own. She was down there worshipping uh, the river god, the fertility god, Harpy. And so she determined to take this little baby and make it the future heir to the throne of the Pharaoh. Well, Moses grew up in an environment like this, you know. He could have become the Pharaoh. He could have been a mummy in the Cairo Museum. He could have been buried in a royal tomb like Tutankhamun. But Moses made a choice. It's recorded in the book of Hebrews and in chapter 11. It says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, 
refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Do you think it was a good choice? We are on top of Mount Tabor, and this is the traditional site for the Transfiguration. In fact, behind me is the church that uh, is supposed to mark the spot where this Transfiguration took place. And just in case you're a little rusty on what happened up here, let me read to you from Matthew chapter 17 and from verse 1 onwards, where it says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John his brother, brought them up on a high mountain by themselves and was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. All right, well now we are told here that Moses and Elijah were on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. How did they get here? No problem about Elijah, of course, because the biblical account tells us that Elijah was taken straight to heaven before he died. But haven't we already noticed that Moses died and was buried on Mount Nebo? Then how come he's here, alive? There are two verses that I want to read to you that I think are significant in this connection. The first one is in the book of Romans, and in chapter 5, verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. All right. Apparently, there was something happened at the time of Moses that ruined the reign of death. And what was it? I'm turning over here to the book of Jude, little book of Jude, and in verse 9 where it says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Now, there was some argument about the body of Moses, and the devil was objecting. What was it? Up until the time of Moses, nobody had ever come back from the dead. Nobody had ever risen from the dead bodily. And when Michael the archangel came down to raise Moses from the dead, naturally, the devil was very upset about it, and he disputed it. But all that God said was, the Lord rebuke thee, Satan. And so apparently, Moses was raised bodily from the dead. And so when Jesus Christ stood on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah came down and were able to talk to him on this mountain. Moses then was alive. He's alive today. And isn't that a lot better than being a cold, stiff mummy in the Cairo Museum? No matter how fabulous a burial he might have had, he could have had all the riches in the world bestowed upon his body. But if he's still in the Cairo Museum, that's not nearly as good as being alive, is it? Alive and living forever. So, Moses made the right choice, don't you think? And everyone in this world has to make a choice. I have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. We've all got to make a choice. We need to choose to follow Christ and believe in Him. We need to choose to keep His true Sabbath day. We need to choose to follow His example and be baptized. You might say, well, is it really necessary? Does it really matter? It certainly does. In Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 26 it says, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no longer a sacrifice for sins. Well, Christ has made the sacrifice for our sins. But it tells us that if we sin willfully, that means if we do continue to do something that we no, we should not be doing or continue any course that is contrary to the Word of God when we know that we shouldn't follow that course. It says Christ's sacrifice does not avail for us. In fact, it goes on to say here in Hebrews chapter 10, anyone who has rejected Moses, Lord, dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and insulted the Spirit of grace. You see, the Spirit of grace, God's Spirit, speaks to our hearts and tells us this is the way. Walk in it. Do what is right. Keep God's commandments. Follow Christ in all things. And if we don't do that, we are really insulting the Spirit of grace. 
Jesus Christ gave a rather serious statement over here in the book of Matthew and in chapter 12 where he says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. It's a terrible thing to think that there is a sin that can't be forgiven. And what is that sin? It says, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. Now, how do we commit this sin against the Holy Spirit? It's like Pharaoh hardening his heart against the voice of the Spirit of God. And if the Spirit of God is telling you to do something, whether it be to accept Christ, or whether it be to keep his true Sabbath day, or whether it be to be baptized, and you say, no, I'm not going to listen to that Spirit, you are then committing the sin against the Holy Spirit. In Proverbs chapter 14, it says, Verse 12, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Some people think, well, it seems all right to me. Don't trust to what seems all right. There's only one safe thing to do, and that's do what the Bible tells you to do. Well, when is the right time to make such a decision? There's really only one time, and that's now. There's a verse in Isaiah that says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So there's only one real time to do it. Make the decision now. It's the only safe time to make it. And if you make that decision now, there's one thing I want to tell you. The Lord Jesus Christ is waiting for you now. Petra, the rose-red city, half as old as time, is next on our itinerary. The tombs and temples carved out of the solid rock have to be seen to be believed. And Petra was another of those great cities that was lost and only discovered in the 19th century.